Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 47. Do you feel like you understand how Python works under the hood? What is syntactic sugar, and how much of it should be in Python? This week on the show, we have Brett Cannon. Brett's a Python core developer, and he's been working on a series of articles where he's unraveling the syntax of Python. This series is a fantastic resource for those wanting to learn how Python is structured and works at its core. Brett wants to see a version of Python that can run in web browsers. So he started to break Python into its syntactic elements to try to answer the question, what are the core elements of Python? This detailed series takes the reader along for the ride. Brett also works at Microsoft as the dev manager for the Python extension for VS Code. Brett is also serving his second term on the Python Steering Council, and we discuss recent Python enhancement proposals, PEPs, that the council is considering. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean's app platform. So let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hi, Brett. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Christopher, for having me on. I wonder if we could start out talking a little bit about the work that you're doing at Microsoft on the Python extension for VS Code. Sure. So I'm the dev manager for the Python extension for VS Code, as you mentioned. So my work is mainly kind of two parts. So I'm what's called a people manager at Microsoft, which means I have people who report to me and I'm kind of in charge of the whole, you send me a little report every six months or so about how you did and I worry about getting you promoted and that kind of thing. So that's one part of my job. And then the other part is being the dev manager of the actual team, which means I basically make sure that the extension basically gets what the product managers need done. I don't manage the sprints. I have a tech lead, uh, luckily for that. Thank you, (laughs) Karthik. But otherwise, I kind of make sure that our general development process is going well. I handle the conversations with management up the chain to our VP for any dev questions, whether something's tenable, what a rough development schedule looks like and that sort of stuff okay cool yeah so i had savannah on a little while ago to talk about yep. um, some of the upgrades with pylance mm-hmm. and so is is that team sort of on the side of what you're doing or, or are they connected in in more ways yeah so the way it basically breaks down is so my team's in charge of what we call the core extensions so if you go onto the vs code marketplace and search for python or honestly just go to the vs code marketplace for the most downloaded extensions, it's pretty easy to find. I'm in charge of that extension. And so what that generally encompasses is we are in charge of finding your environment, which includes like your interpreter, your virtual environment, conda environment, that kind of thing. Running code through that environment, hooking up linters, formatters, testing, and debugging. And then from that point, uh, what you can do is if you install Pylance, they then plug in to our extension and basically act as the language server, which provides some more type check linting stuff and auto completions and like syntax error detection. In terms of general hierarchy, they're basically a sibling team to me. Okay. We're all part of the same work group. So basically my manager is the also the one level up or skip manager to the pilots team. So I know the pilots team well. I, I talk with them regularly and we all kind of work together at Microsoft to try to get the Python development experience on VS Code as best as we can. It's shocking to me the amount of people doing Python at <laughs> at Microsoft now, which is really cool. And they're also, I feel like in some ways, a lot of the people that are working with Microsoft are also you know interested in you know promoting Python you know on places like this podcast and talks and things like that. Yeah. Is that your experience? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's it's been interesting. I joined the company over five years ago now. And so I joined just a couple of years into the Satya era. Okay. And there was a very 
And the reason I did join when I did was partially because I moved and I couldn't work remote for Google at the time. So I left Google. But it was also because there was obviously a shift at the company towards their approach to the open source community. And when I joined, there was a very marked internal shift towards like open source is a good thing. Give back where it makes sense. Be a good citizen. And if we're going to consume, we should also produce and help out and all that. And so that kind of meshed with my view of open source. And so I was very happy and willing to join Microsoft as that kind of company. And it's just perpetuated. So we are constantly told like, hey, we should try to make those connections with the community to help out. Not only because it benefits us as a company to have those kind of connections to be able to go like, hey, we're trying to make, uh, I'm just not picking on anyone specific, but like, hey, we're trying to get like auto completions working with Pandas. Okay, so let's go talk to the Pandas team. But we don't want to come in as just total random strangers. We want to also try to help them out so that there's benefit to them at the community because a lot of us care about Python as a community overall, uh, not just, oh, how do we best get value to Microsoft by plugging into the Python community, right? Like, I, I very, very much view myself as a member of the Python community who happens to work at Microsoft to try to make sure that things from Microsoft work as well as possible for Python. And the whole team generally has that view. So it's led to a very nice perspective of, yeah, yeah, we're obviously working for a company that's trying to make money long-term over using and implementing and doing whatever with Python. But there's also very much, we also don't want to screw anything up and we want to give back. We want to show our support to this community as best we can because this is very much a symbiotic relationship. And so, yeah, it's led to, a reasonable staffing of people, I think, contributing to try to make Python development as good as possible, not only obviously for Azure, but in general. Yeah, no, it's it's been really great talking to all these different players in, in that space and a lot of the developer relations people. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's helping to to show what you're talking about, that sort of shift that, <laughs> of wanting to give back to the community. So I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly frank, if the company wasn't willing to give back to the community, I wouldn't be there. That's great. So how long have you been part of the core Python team? So there's two parts to that. So there's the, when did Brett subscribe to Python Dev? Okay. Uh, that was mid-June 2002. And then there's when did Brett get his commit bit? And so that actually happened April 18th, 2003. Uh, I actually memorized the date. <laughs> I pulled up the commit actually a couple times. So I am past 17 years at this point. Wow. Yeah. And, and so we were talking a little bit before we started uh, about your background in, in C. Has that been really crucial for you to be able to contribute in those ways? It helped. I don't, I wouldn't say it's crucial. So my actual first contribution to Python stemmed from my contribution to the Python cookbook first edition, I actually implemented stir p time in pure Python because I needed it on Windows. And at the time, time stir p time the function was only available on Unix machines because it just came with glibc. And so I re-implemented it, although you had to manually type in like the name of some months and stuff, and it really irked me. <laughs> and then at, it, it it actually irked me so much that as a graduation gift to myself after I graduated with my philosophy degree, I spent the week after implementing an algorithm that used stir f time to basically reverse engineer the the locale information for dates and times. And then I got it to work. And like, oh, cool, you don't have to type anything in anymore. So that would mean this would actually work without any user input on Windows. So I just emailed Python dev afterwards and after asking alex martelli the author who, how the heck do i get this into python i think it might be useful and they walked me through the process and i got committed so my actually first commit was pure python wow that's cool and it's actually still in there if you go and actually look at the stir pi stir p time code a good chunk of it's still my original code from way back in 2002 all right <laughs> now that's not to say the c knowledge didn't help because i stayed on after that and started to do the Python dev summaries, which back then was a semi-monthly summary of everything that happened on the Python dev mailing list, just for easier digestibility for people who just couldn't keep up with the volume. Because I took a gap year between my bachelor's in philosophy and doing a master's in computer science. And I had the time and I wanted to learn. So that worked out really well. But it also meant that anytime something came in, so I said, oh, there's a bug here. 
I could raise my hand and say, oh, I'll take a look. And then I was able to dive into the C code. And very luckily, the C Python code base is a very clean, reasonably organ- well-organized C code base. Like it's one of the cleanest I've ever worked on in terms of C. So that helped a lot as well. But yeah, there's definitely some perks to knowing some C already. Is that by design? Is that, Are there people who groom that code base to, to make sure that it, it stays that way and doesn't get you know, kind of a spaghetti like, <laughs> I wouldn't say we go through and groom it specifically, but it is it is a very specific goal in any PR review that the code stay readable. For instance, for the longest time, we actually had a general rule on the team that the interpreter could not get complicated to make sure that it was easily understandable for external contributors and anyone else who wanted to come forward and help out. That's not quite held up because as <laughs> I'm sure everyone listening knows Python's popularity has gotten kind of big at this point. (laughs) And (laughs) so telling everyone, no, we don't want this because while it might speed up Python, it's going to make the code harder to read. The pushback from the general community started to kind of be a little hard on that. So we've let that one go a bit, but we've persistently gone like gone along the idea that it is important to keep it readable just because we have a lot of external contributors who try to help out and the core team's only so big with so much time on their hands because to be perfectly honest, the vast majority of core devs do not get any paid time. Like I get, I get 20% of my time thanks to Microsoft and I steal a bit more uh, when I can. Okay. But the vast majority of people get zero paid time. It's all volunteers. And because of that, we have to make sure that it's easy for people to jump in and out of the code base as appropriate. So we continuously make sure that as we accept pull requests that the code does not get worse in any way and tries to stay nice and clean and readable. And doing things like you were doing initially with kind of managing all of the the information and, and you know creating these summary reports, that's still kind of a role that somebody who's interested in, you know, getting started and, and wanting to contribute could potentially do? Uh, I'm sure someone could definitely do it if they chose to. Although ironically the volume on Python dev has dropped significantly. Back then, all traffic went through Python Dev. But subsequently, the volume got so high, we actually have created multiple mailing lists to kind of manage that. So, for instance, we now have Python Ideas, where people are encouraged to go if they have just a random idea about how to improve the language. And then there are people there who can help show previous discussions as to that idea has actually already been discussed and decide no, or that is a new idea, but here are some issues, or okay, let's discuss this, there's a kernel of idea, or that's great, we should definitely discuss it as a group and then take it forward to Python dev. We also have Python committers, which is a publicly archived, but only open to core devs for discussions that really just don't need public commentary, to put it nicely. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) Someone definitely, I'm sure, could write summaries of all this stuff. I don't know if the volume honestly has gotten so big that it'd be possible for one person one one person taking a gap year to keep up with it all on top of it being spread across three different mailing lists. I mean, when I started back in 2002, I still, I constantly ran into people who either never heard of Python or just went, that's the language where white space matters, isn't it? <laughs> like, the volume was complete, like, orders of magnitude different. So... Uh, I don't want to discourage anyone who wants to give this a shot, but I just don't know if the volume would necessarily lend itself towards one person covering all of this. But if someone wanted to do a blog post summary once a month or every two weeks and publish that out somewhere, I'm sure people would read it. Yeah. I was just thinking there's other ways to to help with the you know the core project in, in additional ways. Oh yeah, there's so many. Yeah, I mean, we have. I mean, people helping with translations, people people helping with documentation. It's not just. It's not all about the code. It, there's an entire ecosystem and a project and community around all this that have needs that run the gamut. So there's. You're you're right, Christopher. There's definitely. It's not just about the code. It's about all of it. It's a whole package, and there's always room for help. What are if you can talk about them? What are features that you're excited that Python is looking at adding, say, in the next revision? That's an interesting question. So we actually just started a new steering council. So we currently have two PEPs in front of us. So I want to talk about things that we haven't made official decisions about. I understand. uh, Because that's a bit more interesting because Python 3.9 just came out. And I honestly, 
every every version's kind of a blur to me. It's just, <laughs> I know this yeah. got in, I just don't know where the cutoff landed for me. So it's just kind of, it's in Python now. It's I, And I run the newest version, so I know I have it. I just don't remember when it went in. But in terms of potential future features, one is actually deprecating disk utils. Okay. Getting that out of the standard library because it's so brittle that uh, people are constantly not willing to touch the code because we're too worried we're going to break someone's build stuff. So we're trying to actually just rip it out, just take rip the Band-Aid, and just like, you know what? We are not, the standard library does not move at the speed of Python's packaging ecosystem. So we should just not pretend that we know how to manage that kind of thing. And so there's a pet before us to actually take that out and just deprecate it. Okay. And just go use setup tools or flit or poetry or any of the other uh, build tools and just basically let them own the experience. And then the other one that's in front of us that's actually kind of, there's actually an idea that is split across three peps with one competing pep, if you can keep that straight, (laughs) on pattern matching. So if you have any experience with functional programming language, you've you've probably come across this, where basically you're able to have something like a match statement that doesn't, it's not quite like an if, elif uh, chain or switch statement that you might be familiar with from other languages where it's all based on like some kind of like is this number greater than that it's typically used more in terms of matching against structure so like how long how many items are in this tuple is this an object with this structure Hmm. that sort of thing it makes a lot more sense when you actually look at it but guido uh brand butcher and i believe there's two other co-authors wrote a uh, PEP 634, which tries to add pattern matching to Python. And then there's PEP 635 and 636 also by them that give kind of more background information on this whole thing, because it's been a massive undertaking for them to write this PEP and a lot of discussion back and forth. Like there was a previous PEP, I think it was 622 or 620 that they did that got a lot of feedback and just to manage the volume, they actually wrote those three PEPs. And then Nick Coughlin has written a competing pep called 642 that cha- takes a different syntactic approach to try to implement pattern matching. So that's currently in front of the new steering council as well. So we have not made an official call yet. Um, the 2020 steering council made an initial recommendation that PEP 634 would be accepted, but we didn't have enough time in the 2020 term to feel like we could come to a full decision on it. And so we basically made a tentative recommendation to the next steering council, and we're, gonna, and we're letting this steering council make the final decision. Okay. I have no date on when that's going to happen specifically, but it is being actively discussed. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean's App Platform. DigitalOcean's App Platform is a new platform-as-a-service solution to build modern cloud-native apps. With App Platform... You can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. Simply point your GitHub repository and let App Platform do all the heavy lifting related to infrastructure. Get started on DigitalOcean's App Platform for free at do.co slash realpython. That's do.co slash realpython. I guess that kind of brings up the idea of being a member of the steering council. Well, so I've I've actually been on the so I've been on the steering council since its founding in 2019. We hold so Guido retired July 2018, mm-hmm. and then the inaugural council started February of 2019, just due to timing of when we figured out what kind of governance model we wanted, how to do the voting for that, and then actually holding the election. And then what we did was we decided to basically, it's tied to a release cadence. So basically you're a steering council for a release. Okay. And at that time, that was roughly 18 months, but that uh, release of Python was actually ending around October, November. I think maybe technically it was December because that was 3.8. But then subsequently we switched to an annual cadence, which is basically meant that we now have one year steering councils. And we basically... Uh, ask for nominees during the first two weeks of November. We then lock down the nominees and just allow them to answer any questions, whatever, for the latter half of November. And then we vote 
for the first uh, first half of December. And then that leads to the new steering council that technically starts December uh, 16th, but really doesn't start till January 1st. Okay. And so we actually just had our first meeting of the year this past Monday. And yeah, we meet once a week and talk for an hour about whatever is shot our way on top of time permitting, uh, <laughs> kind of where we think we need to kind of either help direct things or help make things happen. The way I view it is we're kind of we're kind of the backstop for the C Python project and the Python language. So basically, if the entire development team quit tomorrow, the five of us would be kind of in charge of making sure the wheels don't completely go off and we can get the project back up and going. So okay. to, to me, that means what do we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen? Right. Uh, so like, how do we prevent burnout? How can we make contributing yeah. easier? How can we make the core dev experience easier? Dealing with any disagreements, helping reach consensus on things. If consensus can't be reached, being the final decider on things, basically what Guido's former role was. And that's it. It's just basically just kind of just keeping the project going. Yeah, that's cool. So you've been retained as part of the steering council, it sounds yes. like. I was not voted off the island. All right, great. Partly why I wanted to have you come on the show is uh, we had talked about on a previous episode, uh, David and I, about your syntactic sugar unraveling series. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of just get a little bit of background on it and just kind of kind of discuss some of the, the concepts that you're covering in it. And I think the first thing I wanted to talk about is just the idea of I'm a little confused at the usage of the term syntactic sugar, and that might be my own personal not having a, a lot of background in computer science. When I think of syntactic sugar and the way I've heard it used in other places and tutorials and articles and such is things like decorators or other kinds of kind of unique looking structures inside of the language uh, that that maybe simplify the way something's written to kind of make it uh, quicker. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like as I go further and deeper into the series, I'm like, maybe I don't completely understand what this term means. So I don't know if you could kind of, kind of start there. Uh, well, I actually say your definition's spot on. Okay. It's just you have to be willing to let go of what you define as simple. Okay, sure. So to me, syntactic sugar is anything that is syntactically added to a language like Python that you technically don't have to have. Hmm. Right. It, it's just, it, it's a sprinkle of syntactic sugar. It's it's a nicety. It's it, we could totally get by without it. It doesn't provide any magical sem uh, semantics that you can derive from the language in some other way. But it makes life simpler. As you said, decorators is a perfect example. Decorators are literally nothing but an at sign that just implies a function call that gets passed in an, a function object. Right. It's really simple. It's not. It doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. You could easily just define your function and then take the decorator, ditch the at, and just go name a function equals decorator and then pass it in the function. And you basically have replicated exactly what decorators do. Right. I mean, and that's literally what it does underneath the hood. It's just I think a lot of people don't realize that Python syntactic sugar, from that perspective of just giving you syntax that really underneath the hood you could do a whole not could do another way without any issue goes really deep all right and that's actually a lot of where its flexibility comes from like i don't think a lot of people realize that like plus is nothing special it's literally a method call yeah and you i mean as as you said you can read the blog post but it's just i think kind of mind-boggling and eye-opening and to realize that so much of Python really isn't inherent in its design to the point perspective of, oh, I couldn't make that work in Python if I didn't have it. It's actually, Python just gives you a lot of niceties to make your life more productive uh, in terms of a software developer. But in actuality, we could take it away and you could totally more or less end up with roughly the same result. You might, you won't have the nice plus symbol to mean addition, but you could totally fake it with method calls. You really don't have to have us give you the plus symbol to make it work. And to me, that's what syntactic sugar is. Is just, if I took the syntax away, could you get the equivalent semantics some other way? And if the answer is yes, then yeah, it's, it's a nicety, but technically we could take it away from you and you could still get the same end result. So in this case, 
a, lo- a large number of these, the the way that Python's created as a language is it's basically almost everything is an object, you know, everything inside of mm-hmm. the language is an object. And so when you're thinking of something like an integer, as it's defined, it has methods. And so to call something like addition on that, it actually is calling to these, you know, methods underneath it. And you use the term magic methods. And I, I hear a lot of people use that also. And I just want to kind of, I'm kind of breaking things down because I want to make sure I got this clear. Whereas I hear a lot of other people say, oh, they actually, they really should be always called dunder methods with a double underscore in the name of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't really care. Like, I, I, there's always a lot of people that get religious uh, on one side of these battles, <laughs> one way or the other. And, but I always, I'm kind of intrigued in why, what the preference is uh, between, between those two and, you know, which, which way do you kind of lean in that way? Well, and funny enough, the the language reference calls them special methods. So all, special, okay. So there's, the there's three ways. <laughs> so the way I call it is, I call I historically have called them magic methods or maybe special methods. I probably mentally might start calling them special methods because I keep right reading the word special when I read through the language reference for these blog posts. Hmm. It's good to know. But I, I mean, I still say dunder, right? When I talk about them, like the dunder add method, I don't say the magic add method or the special add method. So when I refer to them, I, I use the term dunder for double underscore. Yeah. But yeah, I, I usually technically separate them just because, for instance, you might see some projects use like a dunder version attribute to specify what the version is. Which, by the way, you don't have to do anymore, thanks to uh, importlib.metadata, which lets you actually query a package for the version, just a total aside. (laughs) Good to know, yeah. So I I view it as a difference between the naming of something and whether or not it has special meaning to the language and interpreter. So that's where I draw the distinction between a dunder method, as in that's just named dunder add, versus, oh, it's a magic or special method because the plus operator in Python actually will do something special based on the existence of a dunder add method so that's where i draw the distinction in the terminology okay so in general the idea of syntactic sugar is a is a good thing i hope so (laughs) are there places that it can be kind of overused potentially i mean it's it's balanced right like to me python's goal is to make people productive Right. And one way you make people productive is you make code readable and easy to understand. And sometimes there is a certain pattern that is so common, it makes sense to add new syntax to the language to simplify that pattern to be easier to identify and understand and easier to type and everything else that leads you to be more productive. As you mentioned, decorators are a perfect example. There is nothing special about it, but about them. You could totally do them now without them. And we, and we did for decades, literally. But I don't think anyone would argue that decorators aren't handy. And the reason they are handy is they're a little bit of syntax that took something that was a common practice and made them much easier to comprehend and visually see, right? Because before we had decorators, you'd write your function or method or whatever, or what have you. And then at the bottom, you'd reassign the name calling it through some function that would do something funky to the function object to make it do something different. But with decorators, what we were able to do is syntactically say, hey, these things should be attached to the top to visibly see that the function you're about to read is not going to exactly do the thing you expect. It's going to do some other things because it's going to go through these decorators that might change its semantics. So you should be well aware when you start reading from the def line that the thing that this name is going to be attached to won't be exactly what you're about to read, potentially. Because otherwise, before you go see, oh, a def, okay, this function does this. Okay, cool. Oh, wait a second. There's these other functions that are getting past this function object that are going to tweak what it does. And so then you had to shift your your mental model of what that function or method did after reading it. Compared to decorators, where you shift a lot of information to the top so you can actually have the right mindset while you read. Yeah, visually, it, it kind of gives you the heads up very quickly. Exactly. And to me, that is the definition of good syntax, something that not only is that is useful both for reading and writing and leads to 
kind of like an improvement in con- cognitive understanding of what's going on in the program, right? You never want to see syntax be added that makes things harder to understand. <laughs> yeah. If syntax doesn't open up either isn't a great generalization of a concept that we were already doing as a community that makes things easier or did not significantly lower the cognitive overhead or the ability to ease the writing of certain algorithms or problems, then that's not a good use of the syntax. It's, it just becomes overhead of having to learn new syntax that you just honestly won't use very much and it doesn't simplify any understanding, right? Like assignment expressions, uh, the Waller's operator are a good example. A lot of people argued against that because they said it's going to be a new piece of syntax that I don't think would be used enough to warrant the cognitive overhead of having to learn yet another piece of syntax in Python. Yeah. Now, I personally didn't think that, and I fell on the side of, yeah, I, I can see usefulness of this, let's go with it. Because I saw it as a way to simplify certain patterns of like, all right, you always have to set this variable to none, and then you check it, and then you do an assignment and all this other stuff, and I can now simplify that to a single line, fully understand the, the concept that this variable is either going to have a default value potentially or not based on what the return is. If it doesn't have it, I'm going to assign something. And I've used it multiple times now, and I'm very happy with it. And I think that led to a cognitive lightening, of, as it were, of the load on my brain of certain patterns. Yeah. And so that is basically where I see the benefits of this syntactic sugar is just opening the door to possibilities that just are easier to comprehend. Yeah, you're using it in a couple of the examples already in the the unraveling sort of series. I, those made sense to me kind of right away. You know, I've yeah. kind of embraced it. Again, I'm kind of newer to the language, so... You know, it's easier for me to like maybe to embrace certain changes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but it, it it was like, oh, that makes sense. Like, let's save the the step and in this process of like the the assignment as you go is actually seems to be a really kind of a useful thing. Funny enough, actually, uh, the assignment ex, uh, assignment expressions actually close the door to actually unraveling a lot of the Python syntax as syntactic sugar because it allows different semantics of what a variable will be bound to at different times. Like if you, um, like the best way to think about it is if you use a Wallace operator in, as an argument to a function call, right, that means subsequently the, uh, the arguments later on in that function call and that whole, in that list of arguments that you're passing in can use that assignment expression, right? So that variable you just created has to be available later on, which means you can't like lift out things out of like a function call that you're passing in. And like, oh, you know what, I will just make this a thing outside of the function. And just because I know the order of things like you really have to work a lot harder to kind of lift stuff out because the order of execution becomes much more sensitive of what's going on because there's a potential new variable that suddenly just appeared because of slam expressions. Right. Okay. So I've been able to use it for a couple tricks to kind of get the point across that, yeah, hey, this isn't magic stuff that's happening in Python when you use the syntax. It really is just kind of simplified to this. But it also closes the door on my face in a couple other ways in which I can't, like, you know what, I could easily explain this this way, but you know what, my expressions completely break it. So I really can't go that route. Hmm. Okay. I guess that's kind of like the double-edged sword of, of lots of these kind of things. Yep. Um, okay. So when I went to your site and kind of started looking through the list of articles that you've created. Uh, you had a post just before this whole series, which was talking about the idea of, well, part of it was about WebAssembly. Mm-hmm. And maybe we should talk a little bit about that. I've had a couple people on talking about WebAssembly. The first was Armin Roniker. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a big fan. And, you know, the guy created Flask. And then okay. I had Russell from beware on Mm -hmm. and he's very interested for multiple reasons and kind of similar reasons to i think why you're interested (laughs) the idea of python being able to be used on in uh, other places like uh, being able to use in mobile kind of expanding the idea since the web is sort of i don't know a lingua franca or whatever you want to call it like across computer systems portable and and you know desktops and whatever the idea of having something that can work inside there and getting Python to be involved in that would require some changes. So I don't know if you want to 
dive in a little bit into that? Sure. So, yeah, my interest in WebAssembly stems from, as you said, the fact that Python is not really available in the browser as much as I would like. And that's not to say that I'm I'm not going to sit here and bash JavaScript or anything like that, but I do personally appreciate the Python community enough that I would like to be able to have others benefit from what our community offers, right? Like, I think we're a great place for people to come together and gather and be inclusive and help people out. And I really love this community that Guido helped foster that has led to what it is today. Yeah, And I really want to bring as many people as I can into the community as possible while keeping obviously its, its feel of inclusiveness and diversity and welcoming and all that warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah. And one place we don't have people coming in is in the web and in browser stuff. And the other place is mobile. Yeah. And I mean, we all have fancy pants phones in our pockets that are way more powerful than the first computers a lot of us grew up with. And Lord knows the browsers everywhere. So not being on them means there's a huge part of the py- programming community that isn't getting to experience the, the wonderfulness of the Python community. So for me, getting a WebAssembly version of Python would potentially open that door because as we all know, every phone also has a browser. So it kind of seems like a two for one if we could make that happen. And what that led to is me thinking about how to do that and going, okay, WebAssembly could potentially do that. And then that led to me coming up with what would it take to make that happen? Yeah. Like what steps could I somehow empower to do? Because lots of, as you said, Armin's been on your show and talked about it. And Russell is, uh, is obviously very passionate about the idea of getting Python on mobile and all that. Yeah, definitely. And the browser. Rukash Nenga of Black and Accord Dev also has talked multiple times about it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have said, like, I'd love to see this happen. So I just kind of went, all right, what would that take? And I started to brainstorm. It's like, okay, well, first things first, if I personally were to ever tackle that project, I would have to make it as small as possible because I only have so much free time in my life. And I already have to give buy off from family and friends like, yeah, hey, I'm not coming out or I'm busy right now. I'm, I'm making Python WebAssembly happen. And they go, what? Why can't you come out? <laughs> right. Uh, right. There's a balance in life of how much, how much of my finite time on this planet do I give into Python and personal projects versus having an actual life outside of Python and work, right? Yeah. So I, I just went like, okay, what's it going to take? So how do I find this? The, basically, how do I find the minimum viable Python that would need to be implemented to make things work? And so mentally, I just went like, okay, what is actually the bare minimum semantics that an interpreter or compiler needs to implement that couldn't be implemented via Python itself. And that's actually what kicked off this blog post series, is I'm trying to actually distill down the exact syntax and thus the exact semantics that you can't implement in Python itself, right? Because once you have that, that's your implementation goal. Right. If you know that, everything else can be built on top of Python syntax, right? I could take all this Python syntax that I'm uh, unraveling as syntactic sugar and just translate it into much messier, harder to read Python syntax that I then just have to implement, right? So if I can make and and or go away and actually just make it a conditional expression, I don't have to implement and and or in a WebAssembly compiler, for instance, or a WebAssembly interpreter. I just have to make if work. Okay, yeah. Right, and a lot of these problems then start to distill down to like, all right, I can translate syntax pretty easily potentially, and just kind of transpile it right from like a lot of these languages that transpile down to JavaScript to be able to run in the browser. You can also do that just from one language to another, right? Like I or into the same language, I can just take today's Python and transpile it into no syntactic sugar anywhere Python, and then I just have to be able to run that no syntactic sugar Python some way. So for me, this is step one in terms of trying to figure out where that boundary is of, all right, Brad, if you're going to try to make Python happen in WebAssembly, what is the absolute bare minimum you have to make work so that you can say, with this building block, I can make the rest of Python work because I can just fake the syntax into other syntax. Okay. 
So part of that also of getting down to this core of things that are needed, you had questioned in that very first article, okay, well, would it need a REPL, mm-hmm. this this sort of interactive version of of Python, which I can imagine would be rather difficult to implement in, in you know something like WebAssembly because yeah. you know the, the idea of like it's not going to compile it on the fly and and stuff like that. So I, mm-hmm. I'm not positive on that, but it seems like that would be something that you know certain people would miss, obviously. But it, it's something that I think you're right in the sense that if you're distributing applications and uh, trying to kind of get by past these other areas that it could be a, a, a quick idea of like, okay, this is something we might be able to get rid of. Yeah. And I actually got surprising flack on Twitter over that whole su- suggestion oh, of ditching. Okay. Rifle. Yeah. Like, like how could you do that? Like Python's <laughs> popularity, blah, blah, blah. It's all because of how flexible it is in the ripple and et cetera, et cetera. But the point of that was, well, yeah, as you said, was just, what is the core of Python? What really has to be there? Like, is Python success really because of the REPL? Like, if Python didn't have the REPL, would we really never use it? Is that really it? Is Or not? And for uh, a good example of where I'm coming from with this thinking is, I hear a lot of people these days go, oh, Python's so popular because of all the packages it has on PyPI. Mm. Well, I predate PyPI. Sure. Okay. <laughs> right. Like people come in like thinking, oh my God, this is so amazing. Like I come back when I looked with a jealous eye at CPAN for Perl mm-hmm. and no one knows what the hell that is. Cause back in my day, when I first started with Python, Perl was the, was the language with all the crazy packages out there that helped you do so much. Right. And where's Perl now? Right. Like not, not to belittle Perl, but obviously Perl's popularity has slipped, even though they had a massive amount of packages to help you get things done. So to me, like the number of packages we have on PyPI is a trailing indicator of Python's popularity, not a leading indicator. Okay. To me, the leading indicator is the number of people who have snuck Python into their companies because they really wanted to use it and management wasn't either willing to say yes or was just unaware of the fact that they wanted it. And so they just brought it in anyway, <laughs> right? To me, that really shows the magic and popularity of what Python is, is the fact that people bring it in anyway, whether or not management says yes or is oblivious. The fact that it is so great of a language and community is what has led to people being willing to put in the time and effort to create these packages. That makes sense. For me, saying like, do we need a REPL is very much one of these things of, okay, would Python function without it? Like, is it really that critical to Python? Now, I'm not trying to disparage the idea that the REPL definitely isn't useful as a development tool and is definitely is helpful. But there's also the possibility like, well, couldn't I also just run this code and see Python, have a REPL there to play with something? Does it have to be live in the browser to make it function the way you want? I don't know. Like, this is a totally open question. Like, yeah. the, the, the basic outline of my grand plan to get Python into WebAssembly is first step, what is the actual core of Python? Like, what is literally what I deem the minimum viable Python that needs to exist to be able to implement the rest of Python potentially. With that, that then goes to, okay, I probably am gonna have to write a compliance test suite to kind of represent what those semantics are. And like, how do I make sure I am actually implementing Python appropriately and all that? So after this blog post series is done, what I'm probably gonna do is work with the Python development team, uh, if possible. They might totally shoot this idea down, I don't know yet. (laughs) Okay. This is very much in Brett's head plan. This is not written down and discussed with other people plan. Is come up with a compliance test suite to be able to say like, hey, if you pass this test suite, like you implement Python 3.9 semantics completely. Like you cover the language. This is nothing to do with the standard library. This is just the language. So right, so like PyPy could run this. Circuit Python, MicroPython could run this. When Python and I or Python get Python 3 support they could run this. Like, this would be a way for people to go like, yeah, okay, we are fully compliant with the semantics of the language at this point. Which, by the way, CPython wouldn't pass either because of the bug I found with uh, in-place power operators as yeah. part of this blog post. I wanted to ask you about and that. And we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I, I once I know what the kernel of the thing is, I also then want to be able to have a test suite to be able to go like, okay, where am I in the, on, on this road of getting this to Python in WebAssembly? And kind of having that for the community because we are more than just C Python. I know it's easy for all of us to think, oh, C Python is Python, 
But CPython really is the reference implementation of the Python programming language. And in my head, they're two separate things, right? They happen to be run by the same group, but they are two distinct, basically artifacts, I guess is a good word, of what the core team and the steering council kind of produces. Because there's the language and the spec and the way the language is meant to work. And then we also provide an implementation, so there's always at least some implementation of the language. Once we have that compliance test suite, the next thing is is actually making the thing. Like, what does it take to actually get Python and web something? And at that point, I don't know if the answer is a compiler. I don't know if it's having an interpreter. It would probably be an interpreter from scratch, just because, for instance, CPython very much expects to be running on a like desktop slash server level machine, right? Like CPython is designed to be fast. We don't want to waste memory in case you're running it on a server where you have like tens of millions of objects live, but we're also not going to minimize the implementation of dictionaries to shave off a couple bytes. Compare that to CircuitPython and MicroPython, who very much do implement their version of Python such that memory usage is as minimal as possible. Yeah. Have those languages given you a guide in some ways, those forks? Well, potentially, but so so here's the interesting thing. Let's think about phones in the browser, right? Like MicroPython and CircuitPython are targeted at IoT devices, right? Like we're talking right. like... Limited RAM. Yeah, yeah, if you get a mega RAM, oh my God, you're, you're living in luxury, right? Right, right. Compare that to our phones or our browser, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking mostly potentially phones here. Yeah. Because that's probably the smallest kind of device I would see running this kind of thing. I don't know about you, but my phone's got like four gigs of RAM. Yeah, yeah, I got right? the big one. <laughs> but the thing, but the funny thing with the browser is you want a small download size. Yeah. So it isn't so much how much memory you use during execution as much as it's how much do you have to download to get going and executing, hmm. right? Like you see these web pages that are downloading like tens of megs that are, take forever in like some like country that's got cruddy internet. So you want to get the download size small. But once you got it on these phones, these phones still, even on the low end, have 256 megs of RAM, right? Like, right. they still could handle you writing in uh, execution-efficient, like, dictionary versus a memory-efficient dictionary. So I think, from my perspective, and once again, this is step three, and I'm still partway through one, <laughs> yeah, um, is going to be an evaluation of, all right, does it make sense to actually compile straight down, or would an interpreter make more sense? And if you do an interpreter or even compiler, does it, is it probably, and my gut feeling says yes, is it best to target small download, but best execution performance? And historically, we don't have that, right? Like PyPy and CPython is at one end of the spectrum where download size is not a concern, right? Python itself is already, thir- I think, like 13 megs on my machine when I last looked, which is totally fine. On my Mac, that's fine. It's not a big deal. Same on my, on my Lenovo. It's not a big deal. That's 13 megs to download and run right same with PyPy, but like iot they have really crazy constraints where they really have to care about every single like kilobyte of use but browser is kind of the middle i wanted to download fast but if you have to use five megs versus five kilobytes to run the same thing but i get like a i can run it like two three times faster with that more memory usage i would argue on the browser you should totally go for it right like i don't think this is going to be the worst performing cost in a web browser, if Python's performance goes that way. So to me, I I would say, that, yes, MicroPython and CircuitPython could very much be an inspiration in terms of if we have to look at what the core semantics of Python that need to be implemented are, they could be used as inspiration, definitely. Like, I still don't know, like, where is that line where if I don't implement something for Python, it's no longer Python? Like, where is that floor? Right. And I don't, we don't have that defined anywhere. We have a def- definition of what the full language is. But if you look at CircuitPython or MicroPython, they have a page that says, like, we don't implement these semantics for various reasons. Either they haven't gotten to it, it's too costly, the performance would hurt too much, what have you. They, and I'm not questioning their justification, but the point is, is CircuitPython and MicroPython are still very serviceable implementations of Python, but they do not fully implement the semantics as laid out in the language specification. So they are definitely an inspiration in terms of realizing that you don't necessarily need to implement all of C Python to have an, a useful version of Python. Now, those people who go Python is useful because of all the packages are definitely going to go. No, you need to implement the whole language because I want to use this package that's there. 
He needs to have pandas. He needs to have everything. <laughs> exactly, right? But if you view this as a greenfield new area, much like IoT was a new area to Python, so you didn't just blindly carry Django over. Hmm. But that doesn't mean all Python code is thrown out. But you are willing to go like, okay, the packaging ecosystem is not going to start here. We might have to build it from scratch. But at least Python, the language is here. Because as, as I said earlier, to me, the leading indicator is people want to bring Python to an area, not whether or not we have the most packages in the world. Mm, yeah. So to me, MicroPython and CircuitPython show that you don't have to bring PyPI with you to still be useful and successful and actually have an impact. So I am purposely not looking at this as, oh, look at all these people who have taken CPython and compiled it down into WebAssembly already. I view this as more just, okay, that showed that there's definitely a taste for this, but obviously at like 13 meg download, it's just too big to ask people to download. So it just, it, all of these are showing me, I don't think it's nuts to do a from scratch Python WebAssembly that doesn't necessarily do as much as CPython does but also doesn't, isn't necessarily MicroPython and CircuitPython based on performance requirements. And there's a potential option for this third middle ground between the two that implements some, but who knows how much. And now my brain's just going, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So that, that's where this whole kind of grand plan goes. I do want to say, though, uh, thanks to my wife, I do have spousal approval to work on this idea. Okay. <laughs> uh, she, He's been learning Python, and the first course she took was the data science one. And they were using kind of a custom kind of Jupyter experience and running Jupyter Hub behind the scenes. And it's why does this keep disconnecting? Why do I have to keep refreshing my browser every time if she like left the class and came back to work on the assignments? And it's like, oh, well, they're using this thing called Jupyter Hub. They're running a big server over at, uh, it was from the University of British Columbia, over at UBC. When you come back in, they probably closed it. And you got to reconnect. It's like, well, why isn't it just in the browser? It's like, well, no one's implemented Python in the browser. It's a whole thing. It's like, you should get on that. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I said, just so you know, that's a multi-year project. This is not a small thing. That's okay. Just go, go make it happen. So that's too funny. <laughs> thank you, very much. Thank you to my wife Andrea for saying like I'm allowed to put time into this, and this is how I convince her. Like, no, no, sweetie, I have to write this blog post. Is to get you Python in the browser. Yeah, and there she you go. <laughs> kind of rolls her eyes now. This, I don't think she's regretted telling me this yet, but at least it makes her go, okay. I'm willing to let you finish it. I, and she, by the way. Uh, a shout out to my wife. She proofreads all my blog posts. Oh, so great. if there's a minimal amount of spelling and grammatical mistakes in them, it's very much thanks to her. So okay. kudos <laughs> to her and thanks for her for doing that. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. We've been discussing a lot about the structure of core Python this week. I thought this course would be an appropriate one to spotlight. It's titled Cool New Features in Python 3.9. The course is based on a real Python article by previous guest, Ger Arna Hiela. And in the course, another previous guest, Christopher Trudeau, is your instructor. And he takes you through accessing and calculating with time zones, merging and updating dictionaries effectively, using decorators based on expressions, combining type pins and other annotations, and much more. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to not only learn what the features of Python 3.9 are, but also how to implement them in your code. And like most of the courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code samples for all the examples shown. All the video courses on RealPython have transcripts and closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. I wanted to dive into the, the article, just the kind of like the you, you kind of, created a, I don't know, a, a template sort of structure mm -hmm. where you, you sort of start up, okay, well, this is the topic we're going to talk about. I love that you have the amount of time that it would take to read <laughs> on your blog post. That's fantastic. And then you say, okay, we're going to talk about, let's say, binary arithmetic yeah. uh, operations. Mm -hmm. And so then you'd start out and you said, well, the, one of the ones that's hardest to implement or to think about would be probably minus because of the way, you know, you can't do, you have to do it in a specific order and mm -hmm. all that kind of made sense to me. And then you use disassemble after kind of creating this simple function to show or dis dis, mm -hmm. um, which I talked about well, with Reuven because I hadn't really seen that used again. That kind of speaks to my 
my background and, and use of Python. Um, but I think that's a fantastic teaching tool yeah. just to kind of show what's going on. So that shows kind of what's happening at, at I don't know, I'm going to say the right words, but at the sort of the C layer of stuff. And then you kind of implementation say, okay, well, layer, yeah. Okay, implementation layer. And then it, and then you have a, a, another layer there where you're kind of showing, okay, well, what is that? And then you're, you actually have a call to the the C Python source code mm-hmm. to show where, where that's actually being implemented. And then the last part or third portion of your sort of template is to recreate it in Python. Yeah. It, did I get the structure right? Yeah, you did. You nailed it. Okay. So initially when I, you know, I like looking at the very first one, I'm like, I don't understand. I don't know where we're going, but by, you know, two or three of these, I'm like, Oh, I get it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that's kind of where I'm like, oh, he's re- really doing a lot of work here, a lot of thought into uh, how would you, you know, recreate these things and, and build these things. And it's not only useful if somebody wants to learn more about the implementation of Python, but also like structurally, to me, like one of the things I, I keep seeing is like, okay, the types uh, underneath there and, and kind of like explaining kind of the importance of well, at this implementation level, you're going to need to think about, you know, the types coming in and out and and kind of showing yeah. the type checking happening inside of your code there. And anyway, it's just explaining a lot. I mean, I it's taken me a while because I don't have the computer science background to sort of let it sink in. But as I read more and more of them kind of starting in, in reverse, it was like, oh, this is really illuminating. And I, I kind of, it, you know, each further one explained more of the <laughs> earlier ones. So... Well, thanks for noticing that and saying that. I do appreciate it because I that was very purposeful. Okay. When I set out on this, basically, I mean, obviously, I know the language well enough that I I kind of mentally just have it as an exercise are able to just kind of do this. I'm like, oh, okay, I can totally do it this way. And just I could just be done with it. But that's the, the, a phrase I've started to use recently. I work to pay for my open source habit. <laughs> sure. And so part of that open source habit is kind of just sharing knowledge and helping others out and just teaching and just kind of just like, I have this knowledge, but there's no reason it needs to stay in my head. And I'm, I'm, I have a bachelor's in philosophy, which means I, I enjoy writing. So I'm happy to blog. Like I actually derive enjoyment from doing it. Yeah. So it just made sense to me like, okay, so I'm going to do this and I can totally blog about this. And I could totally just go like, hey, you can totally un- undo, as you said, like subtraction into this and be done. But that's not, that's fine for those people who are just going to go, oh, okay, cool. But people are going to wonder, how did I figure that out? Like, how did I really make sure I was not making bad assumptions based on outdated knowledge? Because right? as I said, I've been doing this for 17 years. Like, even I, I mean, and I will fully admit, I do not fully know how everything works in Python. I know how a decent chunk works, sure, but that doesn't mean things have not changed underneath me. There are corners that I never just dove into, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But it does mean I happen to be lucky enough to have built up the skill set to know how to figure the stuff out if I need to. And so one of my goals with this blog post series was to use that structure, as you so uh, lucidly explained, to show people how they can do this on their own, yeah. right? This is not a unique skill. This is not a magical skill. And I wanted to demystify all this to go like, look, anyone can do this, right? Like, here's Python code. We use an interpreter, which means we have a big eval loop that is just literally a big for loop with a switch statement in C that just goes, okay, I want to do an add. How do we do an add? So, okay, so let's go look at the code. Okay, the code's here. All right. Let's figure out where to look in the code because honestly, the one of the trickier points with C code that I find is just traversing the code base and especially Python just because it's physically just so large. So I just happen to have memorized where everything is, right? Like I partially, and especially this stuff because um, way back when in 2006, Seven around there that is when PyCon was in Addison, Texas. Uh, I helped finish the uh, compiler because that's when Python switched over to having an AST and doing its compilation that way. What does AST stand for? Sorry. Uh, abstract syntax. Tree. Okay. So the way uh, I have a talk from PyCon Canada, if you ever want to dive into how Python's compiler works, it actually goes from syntax down all the way down to execution. Okay. 
and it goes step by step where all the processes go. But the way Python currently works is it takes your syntax, it goes through what's called tokenizer and basically breaks it up into the words yeah. that it is. Like, okay, that's an if, that's an expression with the number four, a greater than sign in two, all that stuff. And then just breaks it up into a stream of words. And then that goes through the parser, which creates what's called the concrete syntax tree. That is the general structure from a syntactic perspective of what the code is. Okay. That then goes through the comp- goes through and gets converted into an AST, which is more the semantic meaning. Right? Okay. This this is an if node, and this has this kind of expression. It just kind of structures it in a more programmatic way and less of a person way. And then the AST is what goes into the compiler, and then the compiler spits out Python's bytecode, which is what you see when you call the disk module on it. And then the eval loop is just what executes that bytecode. And that's basically how Python works. And before this, we literally just went straight from concrete syntax tree to bytecode. Like there was no this middle AST, let's make it more kind of semantic specific. And we just worked straight from the syntax. And doing it from the AST allows us to do some optimizations, the people optimizer to make some things run a little faster. It's easier to reason about when you're doing the compilation and all that kind of stuff. So it just led to a lot of extra perks. Plus, it allowed us to expose the AST as the module, which various tools are able to use to kind of understand things versus having to deal with the raw syntax, which is a bit more cumbersome. Anyway, point is, is I have all that in my brain because I helped write it. Right. And actually wrote the wrote a page in the dev guide of uh, how Python's compiler works. So because of that, I figured, all right, I might as well help guide people with how where to find all this stuff because I know where it is and it'll take you a while to find it all on your own. So I might as well just link to all the code and just show like, hey, I'm not pulling tricks here. I This is how I figured this out on my, myself right now. You don't have to go diving into all the files to figure it out. I'll just link straight to it in the repo and you can just read along and just see how I did it. Now, obviously, I don't expect everyone to read this the, that part of the blog post. Not everyone knows C and that's totally fine. And I don't think it's critical to understanding. It's just, if you want to come along the journey with me of how I figured this out on this blog post for this piece of syntax, you can follow along. Now, admittedly, I do cheat sometimes. For instance, in my import blog post, I totally leave out all the code. Yeah. Partially because it's implement, I re-implemented the import system in Python back in for import lib back in the th- early three days, but also because it's just so ingrained in my brain that I just kind of knew exactly what I wanted to say. I just wanted to get it done, and I just did. It was going to be treading so much old ground for me since I have the entire import system memorized, and I've given that talk twice. Yeah, I was going to say we can link to those talks if you want to dive a little more into like what's going on with import. I think that'd be good yeah, yeah. resources for them. But it was one of those things where I had to go like, okay, personally, it is going to be a slog and boring as hell, and I'm not going to learn squat. So I took a shortcut and just left that all out. And that's when I just said, hey, if you want to look at the code, go look at it. It's all in Python. It's in the standard library. Go for it. But I'm not going to link to it because I'm going to get zero out of it, and I'm I know I'm going to just totally punt on writing this blog post if I do that. So I called an audible on myself and just like, yeah, you know what? I know I'm not going to want to do this post if I do that. So I'm going to take a shortcut and just not put in the effort and just forget it. I'm just going to write it and just be done with it. So I did. Yeah. So some of the uh, topics that you're covering uh, so far, you start out with um, attribute access. You then go into binary arithmetic, which we, we kind of discussed already a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then the one that you were kind of alluding to earlier is this augmented arithmetic assignment, which if people aren't familiar with mm-hmm. the words, because sometimes those words just seem like, like I, I still had a problem with like the idea of like unary versus binary operations. I was like, huh? Oh yeah. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's like, if you put a minus sign in front of a variable, that's unary because it's working on a single thing versus binary would be, there'd be like two operands that you're sort of applying the operation to. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like it's like terminology yep. is always one of these things. That's like the big stumbling block. Yeah. Especially coming out of the, out of the language reference, right? Where they're like, it's very purposely, very specific yeah, yeah. and it has to be overly like formal English, like ye old piece of code. Right. Or it's just very formal. And it's like, all right, I'm going to, I, I try to, I use the formal names just to kind of get the point across. If you ever read the language reference, this is what I'm talking about. But I, I, I try to avoid it in the post just because it's 
without at least defining it, because otherwise, yeah, you do not, you should not need to have a CS degree to understand how all this works. And the terminology is funky and edge case enough in like kind of like the language corner of computer science that it's very understandable if people don't know what the heck most of these terms are. Yeah. So for that augmented arithmetic or arithmetic, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but anyway, the um, arithmetic, I think. Arithmetic, yeah. It's, I'm like, oh, that's a weird way to say that. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it um it is I mean, that's the first one that I can go, okay, yeah, that actually that's not always implemented in languages. I, I feel like that the idea of like a plus equals is like something that you know, I'm thinking of Swift as a language that they were trying to figure out ways to, you know, how are we gonna implement these things? You know, and this is like more recent <laughs> history. And so they were like trying to figure out like if is that a good idea is that a bad idea yeah actually there's actually a story behind that yeah go ahead i can tell uh so when i was learning python i learned it while i was doing my philosophy degree and i was trying to do a minor uh, anyway i volunteered at the open computing facility at berkeley and uh, a lot of the all of us who were there most of us were either like cog sci students because at that time it was really hard to get into the cs department or cs majors and we just talked computers and programming and stuff and I mentioned that I was learning Python, and one of the members of the staff went, oh, yeah, I don't like Python. It's like, it doesn't even have augmented assignment. <laughs> <laughs> because he was a big Perl fan, and right. Perl had it. Okay. So I was like, is it that big of a deal, really? And then subsequently, a couple of years later, we got it. Uh, Thomas Wuthers, uh, who's also on the steering council and a PSF board member, uh, actually is the person who implemented it. But yeah, it, you definitely don't need it. That's a very, I mean... That's a perfect example of syntactic sugar, right? X plus equals one as a way to just up a variable by one as an increment. You totally do not need syntax for that. X equals X plus one is not that complicated, but it does lower the chance of a typo. Conceptually, it's easy to understand once you see it. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. And then once you understand generally what the rule is, anytime you see any other operator, you'll get what it means. And Yeah, but I hadn't seen the one for power. I'm like... You would do that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that seems like a little, that one seems more ab abstract because I, I think people could be confused as to, you know, what side each thing's on maybe. Yeah. The, the way I always remember is basically just it with augmented assignment is whatever's on the left-hand side of that statement, just assume it's immediately just put on the other side of the equal sign. Yeah. Okay. And that's how I always remember. But yeah, power was definitely one of those. All right, we're going to do, we're, I, I'm willing to bet it's, it was not a, oh, we should do a checklist of only the important things. This is no for consistency to understand that, oh, once you understand that the arithmetic operators can be like plus and arith arithmetic operators can be put on the left hand side. See, I don't know how to it's say okay. these words. <laughs> um, on the left hand side of equals, it probably is going to apply to all of them. And it, people would be shocked if they happen to be the one out of a million people who wanted to use power for this thing. Yeah, but hey, apparently no one uses it considering I found a bug in it. So yeah, 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 <laughs> and you know, for people who are not aware with you know because it's an audio podcast, it's the there would be you know the double asterisk equal. Yep. Yeah, and so so how did you stumble into the bug? You're just like going through each of them as you as you work through it. Yeah. So I'm I'm doing a couple. So with the blog post, I actually have a project I'm keeping called D Sugar, uh, D E S U G A R. And it's all on GitHub, right? Yeah, it's all on GitHub. Uh, all open source. Once again, open source habit. So the way I actually do these blog posts is what I did was is I went through and I looked through the grammar, keyword, module, and I think another uh, nuts, token module, I think, as well. And I basically looked for all the bits of syntax that Python has. And I stuck them all in a readme on this project. And basically, I just decided, like, okay, which one of these do I think I can, or, or syntactic sugar that I can actually kind of devolve into other Python syntax? And then based on that, I went, okay, how do I prove that? Right? It's, it's, it's nice for me to just write a blog saying, oh, you know what? This just converts to this. Isn't that lovely? But that doesn't necessarily prove that the semantics hold up especially for the bigger, uh, the initial uh, expressions that are much easier to kind of test. I'm like, well, all right, if A plus B translates to A dot dunder add B, I should be able to prove that. Okay. So I basically just started to actually implement all this stuff to verify that I got it right. 
And when it came to augmented assignment, I did what I did when I did binary arithmetic. I wrote out a test suite for verifying that this stuff translated to this thing in the end. And luckily for all these things that are in the operator module, it was very easy to test against C Python, right? It's like, okay, here's my version of the operator module that does the thing. And then here's the standard lib version of the operator module that actually just uses the syntax behind a function call, right? So if you go to the operating module and look at the docs for the add function, it just literally says adds two objects. Well, if you look at the implementation, it literally is return A plus B, right? It's nothing fancy. Mine, on the other hand, literally re-implements what plus does. So to make sure I was getting the semantics appropriate, I use the wonderful PyTest project to basically use parameterized arguments where I write the test, and then I have the test run passing in my version of the operator module and then passing in the standard list version of the operator module and just run the same test and just assume they'll both pass. And when there's a discrepancy, Typically, if the standard lib one fails and mine passes, that means my test is wrong and I wrote for my test and didn't actually write for what works. And then if mine fails and the standard lib passes, that just means my re-implementation is wrong. And then when they both pass, they're like, okay, I got it. So this is how I was double-checking myself until I started to get to fancier syntax where I just happen to know it just translates. But in the case of the augmented assignment, I just... I abstracted it out so it was easy enough to just just bang out like subclasses of my test class, go like, okay, so this is for plus, this is for minus, this is for pal, blah, blah, blah. And pal kept failing. I'm like, why does this keep not working? <laughs> like, I don't get this. This the standard that keeps saying this test is wrong, but this follows the exact same pattern of all the other tests because luckily the general structure is so consistent for all the operators that I actually use function closures, right? Like I use functions that generate functions to implement all this stuff. I just say, hey, the magic method is named this and the the right the reverse version is named this. Here's the way the syntax looks for to make the doc string give me a new function that does what you would expect to do. Right. That's why it's popping out a it has to be a, a string each time, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's it's just very cookie cutter. It's very much just a stamp out a new function that works for plus equals for function that works for minus equals. And my tests were passing for everything except for pal. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Why does the standard library version keep saying I'm not doing this right? And then I dove into the code because, I mean, I was writing a blog post and I had to dive into it to figure out how all this worked anyway. And then I looked at how pal worked and I was like, wait, why is that different? And then I noticed that it was implemented in a slightly different way. And then I looked in the code, and lo and behold, it didn't use the same pattern as the rest of the code. And I actually post on Python Dev going like, hey, uh, (laughs) star star equals doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. Anyone know what the heck's going on? Like, is this on purpose or something? Am I missing something here? And then Guido chimed in like, yeah, you know what? Uh... I think Guido actually said, I think it was actually accidentally his doing even. But basically Guido went, yeah, oops. And it just turned out that there was a cheat that someone had done because the C-level API for POW has an optional. If you ever look at the POW built-in function, that not, not the syntax, but the actual POW function, uh-huh. it has an optional third argument. Oh, uh, okay. And the deal is if you pass in nine, it's supposed to work as if it's not there. Well, the implementation for POW in the interpreter for the eval loop called this C function with none set as the argument, which meant that it was acting as if it was just star star, not star star equals, because the the semantics are slightly different, because the way all of this works for binary versus augmented is like, if you do plus, right, Python tries to call dunder add on the left side of the plus, right? So if it's A plus B, it tries to call A dot dunder add. If that doesn't work for some reason, it tries to call, and I'm very much simplifying, read the blog post, it's ridiculously complicated. Yeah, it goes into it really well, yeah. <laughs> it tries to do B dot R, under R add, as right, and the R stands for right side. So there's left and right and all this yeah. stuff. When you do augmented assignment, the way it works is it uses, for like plus equals, if you do A plus equals B, the way it works is it goes A dot dunder I add for in place with that 
uh, I prefix. And then if that doesn't work, it then falls back as if it was just A plus B. Well, the deal was, was because of the shortcut they took by reusing this part of the C API, it wasn't doing the I add bit appropriately. It was skipping it. And it was just using as if it was A star star B. Like A equals A star star B instead of A star star equals B as you would expect. And it was never calling I pow, dunder I pow. It was always just trying to call dunder pow or dunder R pow. Mm-hmm. And that that's it. I literally just looked through the code and like, oops. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, that that's <laughs> the trick. It's that's yeah, it's it's not calling the the C code the the same as the other ones that all had this all right, we're gonna call the I version and then the regular version, then the R version. And it was going straight to the regular and R version. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not right. And so there's an issue open on Python itself to fix some of its own use of its own syntax. Yeah. So yeah, that was yeah, that proved to me a lot, a lot of people implement iPow because no one ever discovered that it wasn't right really being used. Yeah, as you kind of go through these topics, as you kind of go beyond, we, we talked about the augmented and then unary, and then you kind of get into mm-hmm. comparison operators, is and is not. Mm-hmm. And then I think we, when we had the episode we talked about, uh, David was talking about your article on the not. Mm-hmm. Then you get into membership testing, kind of the in, you know, and, and looking into that stuff, and then Boolean, and then you mentioned import statements. Yep. And the last one is assertions, which kind of kind of leads a little bit to you talking about testing again. <laughs> yeah. Where where else are you headed if you want to talk about it? And how, how far do you... I, I was going to mention another thing is that I noticed that the speed has changed um, of the, re- the release <laughs> cadence of your blogs. It started about once a month, and now it seems to be at least a couple a month now. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so the way I decided to tackle the order was, as I mentioned earlier, I basically kind of went through the grammar, and then really what I did was I went through the keyword module and the token module to figure out what all the syntax was. And then I wrote them all down. And I decided, like, okay, what is the the most common thing everyone's probably going to do? Well, it's probably going to be, like, attribute access, right? Like, A.P. Okay, I'm going to start there. And then I kind of just started implementing expressions, right, as the first thing. And the <laughs> unfortunately, implementing expressions is not just... It wasn't a, oh, I can just make this become just this simple method call. It was, no, I have to implement this entire call chain of methods with logic behind it to make it all kind of just work. And I had to look up a lot of the stuff, right? Like you mentioned the not blog post, right? How to implement the not keyword. Yeah. Like I had to look up what our actual definition of truth truthy versus falsiness is, right? Like what is true and what is false, not just the Boolean, like literally what would you call truthy? Right. And I didn't know. So I had to like really dig into the code, right? The So the frequency was low to begin with because this was part of the language where I had an inkling of how all this was supposed to work, but like Dunder Index was added since I looked at all this code. And I really wanted to not screw this up, especially attribute access at the beginning. So it took a while to start doing the post just because literally the post took a lot longer to do because I had to dive more into the C code to see like, okay, this is not just a straight translation to new syntax. This is literally semantics of like a function call of like attribute lookup and then calling a different thing based on the return value and whether you have to check on a certain type and all this other stuff. So it took a lot more to actually make all these expressions work. And then at that point, I just kind of just followed a mental chain of like, okay, well, if I can do dot now, well, everyone's going to ask, how do you do a do three plus two, right? It's kind of the, the traditional, how do you do addition? Right. And I was like, okay, so I'll do binary. Well, once I've done binary, that's kind of just falls into augmented assignment because I know that's just kind of binary arithmetic with an assignment tossed in. So I can do that next. That's not a huge deal. And I just discussed that. So I can do that. Okay. Well, the next thing people always ask after you do math, do addition and subtraction is how you do comparison. Well, okay, so I'll do that next. And so I've just basically kind of just followed a the way my brain worked of like, okay, what would the next question be? And it's just persistently been expressions. Yeah. I've actually now gotten most of the expressions. I I basically have the expressions done that actually use things that use um, those kinds of tokens, like plus and equals and minus and all that stuff. 
I haven't touched a uh, like literal like list and tuples and stuff. That that comes later. But I will tackle those. But now that I have expressions more or less done, I'm moving on to statements. And the trick with statements is there's not a lot of magical logic to them that I have to necessarily look up, right? Like like assert was very straightforward because a lot some of the statements that Python implements is actually defined in the language reference as a translation to other statements. And so I didn't, I don't have to necessarily dig as deep into the C code to see how this works, like I did with plus and not and all these other expressions, because when it's statement to expression or just sta- straight statement to statement, I can just write out, well, here's how it works, and that's it, right? So that's it for now. Now, we'll see if this holds when I like get to four loops, okay. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I, I know how to do this using while, and but I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. But I have to double check. But like, how do you get the how do you get the iterator on something? Like, I'm going to have to redefine the iter built in, right? And how how does ne- how the next built in work and all that stuff? So there's going to be some code in that. But once again, uh, luckily the boundary is just shifting more back out to actual Python code itself and how to do the translation and less what are the actual underlying magic semantics that I'm going to have to look up? So that's basically why the frequencies come up. I will admit my wife sometimes goes like, didn't you just do a blog post? Why do you need me to read another one? <laughs> so yeah, uh, she'll appreciate that people are noticing and appreciate the frequency. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that's basically why it's happened. So what's happened is the expressions is required deeper dive, uh, a deep dive into the C code. And then statements are looking like they're going to be more just straight Python to Python. So, I don't have to dive as much just because I happen to know how the syntax works. But the next step is doing more statements and getting through those. So probably like like for loops are going to be pretty straightforward, I think. People might learn some things they don't know about how uh, how to Python creates iterators for you if you don't define a dunder iter method, for instance, uh, using get item, if you don't know, because that can just become a while loop. Hmm. And then like context managers. Context managers are actually written in pure Python in the original PEP. So the work's kind of done for me on that, on that side. So, because once again, nothing magical to context managers in the with statement. It's very much just a, hey, I'm going to call this thing to get an object to do this thing. And then when it's done at the end, I'm going to call this other method on the, on the context. And that's it. Right. It has those, uh, a couple under methods. Yeah, you know, like kind of going in and then going out, kind of like opening and closing. Yeah, it's under enter and under exit, technically. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, except and then there's the async versions as well because there's async with. But yeah, so I think the the statement versions are going to go a bit faster, and then getting down to um, stuff like indexing, like on dictionaries and lists and sequences and that kind of thing might slow down a little bit because I got to read up on technically. It is it always just called dunder get item? Is there something I'm missing? But it should be too hard. But yeah, that's generally the sequence I'm following is I was doing expressions. Now that I'm more or less done with expressions, I'm moving on to statements. And once those statements are done, I'm going to look at the syntax literals for types, like sets, lists, dictionaries, that kind of thing. And then that'll be it. All right. Yeah. Do you have a, <laughs> is there like a shining like date <laughs> that you're like, oh, it's going to be here or around here or something? I have been doing open source long enough to know to not make that mistake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and pretend I, I will always have the free time I think I'll have. Pandemics especially have proven that point. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so no, uh, the goal is to be done this year. Sure. I'm hoping it won't take that long. As I said, the the posts a bit easier to write now just because it's more straight Python to Python and less having to dive into the C code. I don't know, honestly. I'm hoping, I'm going to say this year I'll be done, hopefully sooner than that, just because I only have so much time to give to Python and I have other things kicking around on the steering council and the packaging ecosystem. And I seem to not be able to say no or to not go, oh yeah, no, that's a good idea. I should make that happen and just not do it. Yeah. So I got enough on my plate that I can't promise a date, but I'm hoping this year. <laughs> That's great. So I have a couple of weekly questions uh, I like to ask everybody. And the first one is, you know, what's something that you're excited about in the world of Python? It could be an event. It could be a package, uh, editor, what have you. 
Well, I can't say editor because I work for I work on one, so I'm extremely biased on that one. Okay, sure. <laughs> I'm looking forward to Pi Cascades. I'm still. Yeah, I just had them on, um, and they were mentioning you'll be part of a, a virtual yeah uh, event. Yeah, there's going to be a panel talking about I think basically open source during the pandemic. Obviously, kind of focused around C Python and stuff. But yeah, I'll be on a panel I think with. Marietta and Guido and Marlene, and I'm sure there's other people whose names I, who I'm just not remembering off the top of my head. Yeah, so I'm so I'll be there talking. I'm looking forward to it. Pi Cascades is on is my regional because I'm in Vancouver, Canada. So it rotates between when there wasn't a pandemic uh, between Vancouver, Seattle, and Portland. And unfortunately, I had to miss it in 2020 because I was in uh, Thailand for a wedding which I luckily got in just before lockdown happened and before things really blew up. That's right, when all that stuff was happening, huh? Yeah, this was back when they actually measured which countries had cases, not how many cases in each yeah. country. To give you an idea, like Thailand had 33, wow. right? Like it was one of those like way early, people weren't panicked. Some countries were really panicking, but others were like, yeah, it's, it hasn't gotten here yet, it's okay. And temperature checks every day and all that, but it was under control at that point. So we luckily got that trip in. But Podcast is my regional and I love it. It's a great conference. It's very beginner oriented and friendly. It's single track, which I absolutely love as a speaker. No Q&A, which I really, really love as a speaker. And I just, uh, I know the people who run it and I think they do an excellent job. And so I just love going to that conference. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, that's great. And it's cheap too for any of you listening who want to go. It's like 20 bucks if for the hobbyist yeah. level and 50 if you have your work paid for it and i think 10 or free if you uh, are, are a student or just need some help paying for it like they they price it really reasonably and honestly i also got a ticket because the badge smells amazing for if you haven't seen it's a wood it's a wood badge like they literally burn it out of I don't know if it's cedar or balsam or what kind of wood it is. But every year when you go, you just, I'm just standing there just sniffing my badge. Like, <laughs> I, need a, like I need my Northwest fix of, but, of just the smell of wood. And it's, it's, it's great. Unfortunately, they're out. So if you're listening to this, you're fortunately you missed the chance. But um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking forward to Podcast Kids. What's something that you want to learn next? Elixir. So I, I have used different phrasings over the years. I'm currently seeing... I am a language polyglot. I used to say I am a language bigot, huh. basically. But unfortunately, uh, that's not a good term these days, I think. So I'm trying to not accidentally say it anymore, uh, even jokingly. Anyway, basically, I love learning new languages. Most of the time, because I'm looking for things to potentially steal for Python. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And I don't know, borrow, steal, whatever term you want to use. Get ideas that we can bring into the language. Right. Because a lot of them actually come from other places. Like, it's really weird that people are now listing Python as the inspiration for something instead of the other way around for me, right? Like, having things that show up in JavaScript and having them reference Python is just blows my mind compared to, like, like Yield is the perfect example. I think I read somewhere, like, JavaScript kind of got ex ideas for, like, generators and stuff from us or something. Well, we got the ideas of generators from the icon programming language. Right, which is a fairly esoteric language out of Arizona State, but Tim Peters knew the language and liked it. And I actually learned the language over U.S. Thanksgiving break for fun, uh, right when I started my PhD of all things, which gives you an idea of how much I, I need to probably not learn new languages because that's my idea of fun. <laughs> sure, but the other thing I'm always doing is just going like, okay, what languages do I want to know? right? Like Python does not fit every single use case, no matter how much I want to, uh, based on this entire podcast, want to get it into more places, right? It doesn't necessarily fit perfectly in every scenario. So what languages do I want to have in my tool chest to be able to have available? So by default is Python. And if it doesn't work, what's the next next language to use? So for instance, for me, for systems programming, it's become Rust. Yeah. I think Rust is great. I don't want to write C anymore. I don't want to write C++ anymore. Any of it. If I can't use Python and it calls us for a systems language, I want to do it in Rust now. So I've added Rust to my toolbox as this is the language I'm willing to use. Just like in the browser, I'm willing to use TypeScript until I get Python there instead. So I want to look at uh, learning Elixir 
because A, I think everyone should learn a functional programming language. And I know a ton, but I say this all the time. And I, I'm going to continue to say it until everyone has learned a functional programming language, which is never, so I'll never stop saying it. But I think people should learn multiple languages to learn different paradigms to really open their brains up to different ways to solving problems. Yeah. Um, That's what all it always is, right? It's, everything's just about solving problems and seeing other ways to do it is great. It, yeah, exactly. It, it's very much just how can you view the problem from a different perspective to potentially find a better solution that's going to be easier for you to maintain and understand when you're asked to read it again in six months because there's a bug and you can the last thing we all we've all been there, right? Come back six months later, like, what the hell was I thinking? That's crazy. That's horrible. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So trying to have the less than the chance of having that happen, because either you got it right the first time, so you don't have to come back in six months, or if you do, they write in a clear enough fashion that you can understand it and find the problem quickly. I find broadening my mind through multiple languages has, always, has helped a lot with that. Uh, I want to learn Elixir because the community seems really nice and welcoming. Like that is a requirement for me, yeah. that the community has to be well run and be nice and welcoming and I've sum submitted PRs to them for their documentation a couple times, and they've been extremely nice about it and very quick on it and all that. But Elixir's approach to server software is really interesting to me because of the way they operate on top of Erlang and the way they they try to handle fault tolerance. I think is really clever and smart. And I mean, you hear stories about Erlang systems that like have like seven, nine uptimes. I mean, this stuff keeps like phone routers running, right? This is why like, your, the phone system never goes down. And so there's a lot of like really interesting things that they do in the Elixir and Erlang community that I want to learn more about to either take from Python or if I discover like it literally is just the underlying structure of the language and the runtime that you just can't replicate. It. I'm like, okay, I, I want this in my tool chain. Yeah. So yeah, Elixir is, is the very long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> no, that's okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been fantastic. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate both the being on, being invited on, being on, and thanks for actually reading the blog post. Like, I have no clue. I think people are reading it. I honestly have not looked at the metrics. As I said, I'm doing this kind of for fun and just to potentially help out people. So noise helped you, Christopher, has made it all worth it. All right. Fantastic. Bye now. Don't forget, you can get started on DigitalOcean's app platform for free at do.co slash realpython. I want to thank Brett Cannon for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.